We in? I think in a moment we should be. And yes, we should now be live. So hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Facebook Live session. And we're joined today by a familiar face to lots of you, John. So hello, John. Do you just want to say hello, hello. and introduce yourself briefly? Hello. So um, my name's John, uh, John Salmon. I'm, um, I've been with Different Travel for about about 10 years now. Must be. Um, yeah, and uh, done a few trips over the years. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, what? So what trips have you been on? What are your sort of like first first memories of, of when you joined us? Um, so the first one was uh, to Kilimanjaro. Um, I just qualified as a nurse at the time. That's and right. I think Lexi wrote me a letter saying, so this is before... Um, you know kind of social media was so active so mm. I, was, I had like a handwritten letter um <laughs> just yeah just inviting me to do uh, to go to Killy and I didn't I didn't know really I'd heard of it but I had no idea kind of what it involved what you were letting yourself in for <laughs> yeah yeah so I went did that uh that was with uh, uh it was a really big group from, that wasn't it yeah 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 these guys were from um I believe like Jersey and Guernsey mm. and Norwich so a mixture of people um we're still Kind of vaguely in touch but i know the group is still still fairly close um and after that so that was a successful trip a bit extreme for my first one but i didn't know any different we like so, throwing people in at the deep uh, end <laughs> yeah and then after that it was india with um i think hertz hospice um mm. that was 40 people from delhi overnight up to uh durham uh, so mcleod gan so the, mm. the kind of foothills of the himalayas um and that was myself, three local guides, and we we obviously did up to a place called um, Triand, mm -hmm. um, and so that that was particularly interesting with forty people on an overnight train. Um, but but yeah, so based on that, I was I was taken on, and then since then I've done numerous treks, um, maybe two or three a year, um, certainly before I was married, and then um, <laughs> but all all over, so uh, Peru. Uh, Nepal, Iceland, Morocco, uh, Borneo, India, uh, obviously in various areas in Nepal, um, Canada, um, the list goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never I was just list. sharing a few of your pictures there. <laughs> while yeah, so that, yeah, that's, I mean, I always find, you know, some interesting characters when you're, when you're away. <laughs> Well, we've got a few people that are joining us now. Just say hello to, to Ian and Alan and Dave. And we've got Suivet joining us in Cambodia. So nice to see uh, a few people joining us online. Hi. So, um, yeah, I mean, as you kind of touched on there, John, you've obviously, throughout the different trips you've done, worked with various different charities as well. And, yeah. and kind of today, that's really what we thought we'd focus on, the sort of charity sure. side of things, which, as most of you watching know, that those are our roots and, and sort of the, the majority of the trips we run are with different charities. Um, I mean, all sorts of charities. We do it with a lot of hospices. We've done quite a few with animal charities or um, health-related charities, some armed forces groups. We will really take take groups from any different charities uh, to wherever it is they they decide they want to go um the well, just that i thought i'd explain roughly how it works because we do get asked sometimes that question by people if, it, if it's the first time on one of these trips um the way the way the sort of trip works is we'll have a conversation with the charity about what what it is they're looking for it might be they want to go to a particular destination to visit a project that they already have links with or it could just yeah. be that they want a particular challenge like you know a really tough challenge like kilimanjaro because they've got a lot of really extreme kind of adventurers out there um but either way we, we kind of come come up with the trip that works for the charity and then the cost side of it, which is obviously something that, that is sort of quite important. Um, the way it will kind of work is that the charity have a sliding scale of cost. So it's always beneficial to the charity. The more people on the trip, the cheaper the costs will be. Um, mm. And then the sponsorships target is set that out of if everybody is raising money for their trip, then at least half of that amount you raise will stay with the charity. The other half or less, depending on how much you raise, of course, will be what the charity then pay for your trip costs. 
charities enjoy this as a well i mean it can be a fantastic way for them to raise huge amounts of money i mean we've had charities that have raised up to a hundred thousand pounds out of one trip which is incredible um that's obviously kind of the more unusual side of it but typically a challenge a charity will raise 40 50 000 maybe out of a trip like this that can all be money they would never otherwise otherwise have got so it's all thanks to you guys sort of getting involved in doing these kind of trips that is this source of revenue for, for the charities that say they, they wouldn't otherwise have access to um so i think yeah um we, we sort of talk a little bit about um you know what what makes these trips successful i mean have you got anything to share john about sort of i don't know any memories of, from the trips especially that you know the charities you work with and what what sort of made it so so special in your mind sure. um i think i've worked with a couple of hospices um more than once so you yeah. get to work on you know it's sometimes we go back to a similar projects um, certainly in the first half of my time of different travels, so we were going back to India, working in Delhi with a, a charity called Can Kids, which was predominantly about um, access to kind of cancer care for, for children and their families um, in Delhi. So you had the, the chance to watch that grow over the years. They, those sort of memories will, will stick with me. Um, but also, I, I guess, um, seeing the hospice, seeing the the audience grow with various uh, hospices. So, for example, uh, Zoe's place with with Muna, which is I think in Coventry, um, done a few a few tracks with them, um, and hopefully some more. Um, and then Vicky from Dove House as well, um, and obviously building relationships with them, um, knowing that they can that the experience that they're offering to people is is gonna is gonna be um, exactly what they kind of signed up for so so the more we did it the more we kind of uh maybe adjusted certain things on the itinerary all of those sort of things mm -hmm. um i think memory wise there's, there's plenty more kind of specific <laughs> memories but maybe we can come on to that in a minute absolutely it was interesting yeah. actually you talking about can kids there because that is probably one of our what well, probably is our longest standing project that we've been involved with overseas i mean that must have yeah. been Gosh, probably nine, ten years ago, we first started working with that trip, and we and they they themselves have now expanded to have a branch down in in Kerala. So we're now taking groups yeah. down to to trek in Kerala and work on the Kankis project there, as well as groups yeah. up in the Himalayas. So it, it's lovely for us to have that uh, that yeah. connection that um, you know with, with that charity as well, which is. I, and it's, I mean, I just add that 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 particular charity is that I mean the the type of work they're doing. Um, I think it's multinational, I think, funded, mm. um, and um, I think some of the medical care is, again, multinational, so they've got people from all over the world, Italy, France, right. um, coming in to help, yeah. but, but in particular, some of, these, some of the people in the more rural communities had no idea in, in terms of symptoms, treatment, how mm. to access it, so there was a, a, a kind of outreach element to it to bring families into the big cities to get treatment. Mm. So to be to see it from a shell of a building, you know, over the years becoming more colourful and meaningful and people using it and getting benefit from it, it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a healthy reminder for me anyway. Um, <laughs> when, when I think about how hard things can get sometimes, I, I cast my mind back to some of the some of the families and the experiences in it and it makes everything seem a bit more kind of yeah. put things into perspective you know? it definitely so. does yeah, the faces and the pictures i just shared say it all really don't yeah, they absolutely. yeah yeah i mean that those kids um they were i think homeless children in in delhi and mm -hmm. um over a course of a a week or so we were in and out of this project refurbing it um, but also people were being brought in for screening and treatment and we had a various kind of people with us and, and they were able to kind of contribute. But they, those kids, um, yeah, brilliant. But they, they were predominantly uh, homeless children from, yeah. from Delhi. Yeah. yeah. So we'll just sort of uh, move away from the, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about some of the trips later. Sure. But Rubia, did you just want to maybe have a quick chat going back to sort of the, the, the charity challenge side of things and, and how the fundraising bit works? Because again, yeah, that's obviously absolutely. A, a challenge I for think, some people out there. As a former participant myself, I've kind of seen it from the other side as well. So mm. when you see that initial fundraising target, it can be a bit daunting seeing such a huge figure. Absolutely. But actually, you'd be quite surprised at how, I wouldn't say easy, but how quickly you can 
to pass that target and there's plenty of ways to kind of tackle it and it doesn't have to be as overwhelming as it can first appear um i mean first and foremost stay in touch with the charities they're the expert fundraisers and they'll help you all the every step along the way and you know um what i tried to do is break it down into more manageable sums and when mm. you look at it in smaller numbers it just becomes all the more achievable and with the timelines of our trips as well you have the the time to to invest into the fundraising side of things so it's not quite as as scary as it could be mm. um and like i say the charities give you tips and also when you're you confirm on one of our bookings we send you a fundraising advice document as well which has plenty of ideas on there um we made a special one particularly for fundraising during lockdown as well so there's all your traditional jumble sales and cake sales and stuff but there's plenty of other innovative ways of raising money as well so john have you come across any anyone who had any unusual ways of fundraising um, or any stories to tell that you can well, think of uh, well uh, it's funny i was speaking with a friend uh trevor trevor wrigley he's so this is a guy you know big character big guy he's got a big beard um <laughs> and he's you know i'll kid you not it's it's a it's a substantial beard and um and he, he's shaving that off as well as his hair um wow. so i've been told um i know he's done it in the past but but I think that captures people's imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with kind of pre kind of lockdown situation, uh, some of the more successful fundraising was like people being like creating an event that people would go to and enjoy. So some sort of gala or event and then getting people to sponsor that and donate to it and then asking people to kind of contribute to, to potentially win those things. Um, I mean, easier said than done for a lot of people, but what we have seen is kind of like-minded people coming together using their skills maybe in their daily jobs just to become a bit more innovative with Mm. fundraising yeah we've seen some virtual versions of things that you would normally do in person so Mm. like you say people using their skills we've Mm. had examples of people doing Mm. online classes for the skills so you can kind of buy a voucher for a sponsorship join yeah. into this online class and like i say there's millions of ways if you you're a bit clever about it yeah them. i think i think it's you know it's so it's so needed in terms of uh plugging the gap with funding here in the uk because i think you know you don't i know the nhs okay they do their best but some some things aren't funded and do rely on, on donations and um i think that money that's raised like every penny um kind of helps and I've, I've seen it over the years make such a difference and um back-to-back trips over the years raising substantial amounts of money um and and keeping keeping services going keeping hospices running and providing a service is it's very very valuable yeah absolutely i think you'll find a lot of people are surprised at just how generous people can be mm-hmm. um a lot of the people times when i was fundraising it was just a case of asking and people had just donate without needing anything back in return necessarily yeah absolutely mm -hmm. i think if people know what it's for because there is a bit of you know presumption but i think the numbers speak so some of the some of the coastal path walks that we've done um i think it's uh down in dorset Mm -hmm. it's just grown and grown and grown so i think you know people know kind of that the money is being put towards something that's so valuable um and and a lot of people have lived or have shared experiences of what you know the kind of what the services are here to provide and i think that kind of resonates with people i think that that sparks their interest to want to help yeah Yeah, that can be really powerful um yeah alan online has just echoed your point really about how generous people are and and you do find that people People actually, and I think even during lockdown, that's possibly increased even more that that people have just felt that you know they want to contribute, they want to do something, and therefore they are they are donating, um, as you say, for such a great cause. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a diff- I think I think in my experience, people, the people that have done best are the people that really cleverly tap into what their peer group are interested in or doing already, whether that's your colleagues or your your family or your your social kind of network. Um, 
you know, if, if you've got friends who love going out for a quiz night, then people that put on a quiz night can literally raise thousands or hundreds anyway yeah. in one evening, you know. Um, yeah. If you've got a bunch of mates that you regularly go out for a curry with, we've had sort of restaurants have allowed us to sort of host an evening on a quiet night. And, and once you've got everyone there, people do raffles and you can sort of use yeah. other ways. I mean, obviously this is out of lockdown we're talking about now, but, yeah. you know, that they're, the community are always very generous as well. And we do find pubs and restaurants are very willing to let people use their venues to do these yeah. events. And, um, yeah. yeah. We've seen seen a lot of sponsorship over the years from from companies, you know. Mm. So, in return Absolutely. for some advertising, for example, mm. a, few, a few photo shops, you know, a few photo opportunities with a t-shirt or whatever or a banner in a remote part of the world, Absolutely. you know. Yeah, it's great advertising, and I think more and more uh, companies, certainly some of the large ones, are leaning more towards the kind of charitable side of things as well and helping the community. So, mm. um, I think. You know, never be afraid to ask because if you if you don't ask, you're not you, you're not going exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of my personal favourites and raise quite a bit of money is trying to find a bit of a unique angle, something that makes you a little bit more different rather than saying sponsor yeah. me. Um, I was fundraising for a school build project, and I thought, well, what does everyone love doing when you're at school? You play tig in a playground, so it was virtual tig. So you're tigging five people get them to donate, get them to take five other people and it soon starts sure. rolling in and it, it was great and as it turned out once I was out there I was the one working on the playground so it all kind of tied in quite yeah. quite well. Yeah, and yeah another yeah. favourite is the Smarty Tubes, buy a multi-pack of Smarties, hand them out and get people to return them but filled with pound coins. Oh wow okay. That's 28 pounds per tube. How much per tube? 28 pounds wow okay so for little investment you're getting maximum return so it's just being clever yeah, with too. with yeah. how you do it and slowly Absolutely. like you say the pennies add up and it all goes to to amazing causes mm. so yeah absolutely yeah yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, possibly that that's a time we, we've kind of touched on it slightly, but occasionally people have said there has been a slight negative perception because oh, at the end of the day, if you are fundraising all this money, I mean, a lot of people will self-fund for their trip, but if you are raising all this money, obviously uh, an element of what you've raised will be covering the costs of you going on the trip. I mean, the, the main the main thing is that you do have to be honest about that. People know that they're sponsoring you to do this particular trip. All of our trips are not holiday. None of them are holidays. They are challenges. They're called a challenge for a good reason. Um, you are putting yourself through, whether it be a physical challenge or, or that emotional challenge. And it's different for everybody. For some people, the challenge is just going out of your comfort zone and, and sleeping in a tent without access to water and bathrooms and, and what have you. Whatever it is you're doing, you are challenging yourself uh, to, to sort of justify the fact that, that you are getting this sponsorship out there. From the charity's point of view, what we, what all of the charity partners we work with unanimously say is that this is a way for them of generating money they would not otherwise get. You could say in an ideal world, people would just donate that money, but that doesn't happen. Um, they are raising money uh, without doubt out of this by the fact that they are laying on this challenge and they're getting maybe 50, 60,000 pounds of revenue that they wouldn't otherwise have got. Um, and I think, you know, another thing occasionally that crops up is the work we do do on a lot of our trips. I know John's touched on already with with hope helping these overseas projects. We're always very, very careful with who we work with overseas to make sure that they are um, solid, sustainable projects. And, and as obviously we've been talking about with Kankids, that's very much proven to be the case. They've just grown from strength to, to strength over the 10 years we've been working with them. When we go out and we do school builds, as Rubia mentioned, things like that, we're always working alongside the local team. We're not taking over jobs that, that you know, other, otherwise local people would have done. We're very much there to just lend our support. And a lot of the money we've raised has actually paid for the salaries of the other people that will be working on the trip, the skilled, the, the, the bricklayers, the carpenters, the electricians that are all local people who wouldn't have otherwise had, had that job at the time. So it's just really to sort of say we're, we're very careful in who we work with and, and how we choose these projects to make sure that that is the case. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's important to add that it is invaluable to the charities, but also to the locals over there as well. Absolutely. But we do also have a self-funded option where you can pay the trip costs and then raise the rest for the charity. So if you are uncomfortable with the charity paying for your trip, you can 
you can push that Absolutely. yourself and your fundraising would go to the charity so there's ways around it and it's like you say that you can be faced with negativity but if you explain the situation a lot of people do kind of accept it isn't just a holiday it is Mm. you know as as you you said Sarah it's so much more than that absolutely yeah um Ian's just commented here one of his great fundraising ideas is he's been giving talks to organization about the challenges that he's done and then they'll donate to the charity in exchange for him giving that talk I know Ian's done really well out of that throughout the years but that could be a great way of doing it uh, because a lot of organizations out there are fascinated to hear about all of these stories and adventures and places that you've been um so yeah there's that's another possible sort of idea there for, for people yeah it's a great way you want you back as well to share those yeah. stories because john i'm sure you've got a million and one stories <laughs> from all your trips uh, absolutely and i think there's a degree of um excitement when it comes to that i think you know we it's a very positive experience and it is um, obviously a challenge. So you are earning that the money that you're sponsored for. Um, but it, but yeah, so, so many stories over the years, um, both uh, about local guides, personal experiences, team experiences. I, I touch wood, I don't think I've ever had a negative experience on one of the tracks. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, I find that people do kind of share stories about, how they get the odd comment when they're out fundraising but majority of people you know i would say a larger proportion donate and and see the good in what people are doing Absolutely. yeah yeah so have you got any any <laughs> stories you can share with us about some of your memories let's talk about the good stuff there oh well i mean I've stories. written down funnily <laughs> enough um i mean in in terms of um the type of work that we've done in places, I think um, India, Vietnam and probably Africa jumped to mind a little bit. Um, obviously, I've mentioned India, um, I've mentioned some of the projects that we've done. Um, also worked with a homeless charity over there, which from a uh, charity from Southampton called St. James's, which mm-hmm. was, again, a uh, very worthy um, kind of experience. But, um, but also in Vietnam, working with um, orphanages over there. so so people have been affected by the Agent Orange uh, chemical from Vietnam War. So quite, you know, a very, um, a very kind of difficult experience for some. Yeah, there we go. This Some Vietnam pictures oh, for you. Um, but, but again, meeting some of those kids and, you know, look, seeing how they were living and, and actually being hands on with, with the project. So I don't, I don't think it's, just as you know, a question of kind of throwing money at things like this. You you can have finance, but you you need to go with your your hands and your heart really. And and I'd say that that's consistent with pretty much everywhere that I've gone. Um, people want people with skills, people with purpose and drive, people who do want to make a difference. So they want people to come with their hands and their heart and get and get involved. Um, I think some of the more funnier ones. I remember being in Vietnam, and I remember uh, one of our one of our crew or one of the group lost their camera, and um, and that camera had some very valuable pictures on there. It had some very sentimental pictures, family photos, um, and it's the second time I've been out there, and I've gone with the guide quite well. Everyone was asleep. Me, the guide, and the cooks were in the kitchen. We were we were just trying the rice wine, you know, seeing if it was <laughs> if it was nice. Um, anyway, he got a call um from the local shaman so the local kind of like priest and the priest said to him if you go to the river now you're going to find this camera and um yeah you need, it's in the waterfall you need to go there now <laughs> so you know we'd, we'd only had one or two rice wines um and we we ran off into the night with our our head headlights on um head torch and I, I, I think I only had flip flops on, but we were running down these hills, ended up in a waterfall um, with a load of local guides swimming around in, at midnight looking for a camera. <laughs> and one of them pulled it out. And, um, you know, that always stuck with me because that lady that had very sentimental mm. photos on there. Um, I think I got to see a slightly other side of the, 
the kind of local guides as well. But that that was a very I'm not saying that Shaman was correct, but um, <laughs> it's certainly a memorable one. Um, but also some of the achievements of individuals on the trek. So you know, being you know five thousand meters up in the pool, being you know five thousand meters up in Kilimanjaro, being in you know forty degree heat in the Sahara, um, and and individuals who are facing adversity so be it physically or emotionally um people who have you know kind of existing health problems or you know a flare-up of an injury all of these things uh altitude as you some of you may know it affects your sleep and your appetite so people that you know not sleeping so well and all of a sudden you know you're kind of in your mind a little bit and you're questioning everything um but but i always see people come through that i always see people race to the challenge and um, some some guys, you know, you you're just inspired by them. Um, you know, there's there's more more than a few, but some that come to mind are Ian Williamson, um, who's probably listening in now. He is watching. Yeah. He's watching. <laughs> I mean, this guy was a a, a machine. Um, and, then, and then Dave Coles, who I've done a couple of treks with up at Everest, and we had an interesting helicopter ride back down from that down a, a few thousand meters, but nevertheless um you know inspirational and then uh pauline bison who again i recently did um well over a year ago now everest with and yeah so there's there's more than that i can mention but um yeah there's always somebody who just and and i think these sort of challenges have a habit of bringing people together they tend to create a unique bond which you, you otherwise wouldn't wouldn't necessarily get yeah. um and I think that that lasts a lifetime, really. Yeah, it's always great to see how how people have kept kept up that friendship from our trips years and years on. Um, I think it's one of the nicest sort of lasting memories of, of all of this, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So we've had a few more people join us now. So hello, Colin, and hello, Marion. They've joined us too. Um, hello. And um, we normally find quite a few other people catch up later in the day. So, and obviously we are going out at a later hour today. So that might've thrown a few people off course, but uh, hello if you're watching this later on in the day as well. So, <laughs> so yes, it's, um, uh, yeah, just, just so many memories. So, I mean, have you got any one favorite trip, John? I mean, I know you've done some trips several times, but have you got any one real that you could actually say was your favorite over the years? That's, that's a really hard question. It is, isn't it? Um, I think, <laughs> In terms of um, achievement, I think Kilimanjaro was probably number one, mm -hmm. and purely because it, it is a summit. It's the highest mountain in Africa. You, you're potentially, you know, you, you, the summit evening is substantial. You're, you're up for 15 hours odd, maybe more if you haven't slept. Um, first time I went, we had lovely weather, no problem. Um, second time I went, we had, you know, very strong winds. Um, so that that I feel is probably number one in terms of uh, kind of physical endurance, um, mm -hmm. sense of achievement. Um, I think in terms of culture and places to go, I mean, I'm a big fan of India, um, such a diverse country, um, but also Vietnam as well. Um, I think Nepal um, has a slight mystery to it because mm -hmm. of the, you know, the the kind of Buddhist um, approach to life, and I think. Um, you know, I've just kind of touched the iceberg with that place. I've done three treks there now. And um, so the answer is I haven't got a favourite, Sarah. I OK, <laughs> fair enough. They're, they're all equally as, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Borneo in the jungle, sleeping in a, you know, wooden hut, torrential rain, um, mm -hmm. but loving every minute of it. So, <laughs> yeah, so every, everyone, every trip brings a different experience, but I think all of them have been, just I've been very fortunate to be included. So, and, and have you got anywhere that's on your bucket list if you, if you could go off and do any trip? <laughs> oh, um, I think I think um, I was toying with the idea of um, going back to Nepal, but also maybe doing the trek traditionally as as um, pre Lukla Airport. So, oh wow. Yeah, so you'd kind of start off in right in the foothills and you would potentially walk the whole route as they would have done before the airport was constructed. I think that's something I want mm -hmm. to experience. Absolutely. 
Yeah. yeah. That'd be something else, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would take a, a bit longer, but I think acclimatisation wise, all these things, it would be great. But also just treading in the footsteps of, you know, people who have who have done that over hundreds of years. Mm. And that's something that I want to experience. But but I think along that way, the, the thing with Nepal is there's so many, so many summits to do. And I think we've got some excellent um kind of guides over there. Um yeah, guys that we've worked with who are so experienced and you're in really safe hands. So you know, you, I think with speaking with them, that the possibilities are endless. So I'm, I'm hoping at some point to to get back to Nepal and 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 maybe hopefully walk from from kind of almost sea level up to up to look and do the base camp trek. Right? Probably draw draw the line at the technical climbing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, thank you for that. that that's that been great to just hear some of your, your stories. And anything. I have just seen the time. We probably ought to wind up uh, pretty much by now and uh, let you all go and have, have some lunch. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, John. It's always nice to have someone uh, join us on of these sessions. And if anyone's got any other questions or anything that you want to fire at us or at John, please feel free in the comments. Um, Next week, actually talking of lunch, next week we thought we would talk all about one of our favourite things, which is the food and all the amazing food that uh, we've experienced on our various travels around the world. Um, certainly within the different travel team, it's, it's very much a favourite topic of conversation. So we thought we'd sort of share some of that with you next week and get your thinking caps on as to favourite meals and what have you. Um, and uh, we'll be back to our regular time next week, which will be um, 11 o'clock, I believe. Yes, I just had to think there for a moment. Um, but um, in the meantime, yeah, have a great week. Enjoy this lovely sunshine that we're having. And we will look forward to catching up with you all later. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>